Hey guys, what's up? This is David Patrick Harry with Church of the Eternal Logos. And today I want to speak to you guys about Christian magic, particularly two major Renaissance figures, Marsilio Ficino and Giovanni Piccadilla Marandola. Now, I've mentioned to you briefly these two gentlemen in previous videos. However, in this video, I want to give a much clearer and authentic description of who they were, their contributive ideas that are going to have a major ripple effect throughout the Renaissance and into um, even the Enlightenment era and modern, uh, modern history. But they were both very much interested in Hermeticism and natural magic um, for Pico, it's going to be dealing with Jewish Kabbalah, but I wanted to talk about who they were, what ideas they contributed that were so important, and have a video where I can reference people back to these two gentlemen when I talk about later Renaissance figures like John Dee, Henry Cornelius Agrippa, Jakob Burma, jo Johann Reuchlin, and people like that. So that's the purpose of this video. So let's go ahead and get into it. First, I want to talk about Marsilio Ficino and who he was. So Ficino lived from 1433 to 1499, and he was the son of a physician to Cosmo de' Medici. So his father was a doctor to Cosimo de' Medici, and if you're not familiar with who Cosimo de' Medici is, he was arguably the wealthiest man in the world at the time. He was a banker and politician there in Florence, and essentially his family run, ran Florence. So, oh, really, his wealth was only to be rivaled by the emperor of China. And, of course, that wasn't a personal wealth like it was for Cosmo. But, but I just wanted to point that out to show how much weight and power the Medici family had within, within Europe at the time, particularly Italy. But so much so that the Vatican, which we'll play later in the story regarding Pico, um, essentially allowed them to have their own dominion there within, within Italy. So his father was a physician, and Ficino essentially was kind of under the tutelage of the power of the Medicis and, of course, was exposed to a lot of the learning and, uh, and libraries and access to knowledge due to his relationship to the Medicis. Now, Ficino was an Italian scholar. He was a Catholic priest. He was a astrologer. He was a magician. And he was also a humanist. And humanism is going to play an important role within our conversation today because humanism is going to color the ontological um, understandings of man, both for Ficino and Pico. And humanism is going to continue to have a important impact within European history. So that's going to color our just our conversations. However, um, Ficino was also the tutor to or the teacher to Pico, as well as Lorenzo de' Medici, who again will figure into our discover our conversation on Pico. But Lorenzo de' Medici is the son of Cosimo de' Medici. And in 1430, or 1438, I'm sorry, there's what's called the Council of Florence. This is an ecumenical council. As an ecumenical council is a, an official, official council uh, between the Latin Church, the Catholic Church, and East, the Eastern Orthodox Church. And this council was trying to reconcile some of the theological differences between the two churches once and for all. In the end, that was unsuccessful. However, what was successful is the bringing into the Western Europe Platonic and Neoplatonic thought. So you have people uh, coming in, Eastern Orthodox scholars, as well as Neoplatonists like George Gemistos Plethon. And Plethon was a Neoplatonist who was instrumental in teaching people Greek, um, helping people understand Platonic understandings of the world, and educated many people. In fact, he was referred to as the second Plato there in Florence. So Cosmo de' Medici, being such a wealthy gentleman, was so fascinated with the revival of Platonic thought that he opened up essentially a, a Plato's Academy there in Florence, and who he chose to head it? Of course, Marsilio Ficino. So Ficino, being a Catholic priest, was already exposed to the scholasticism of the Catholic Church. So 
in the 13th century, you have Thomas Aquinas founding scholasticism, which is using reason as the instrumental means for man to discover God. This, of course, is going to be different from the mystical instrument used to for man to um, encounter God, a little bit different understanding. And, and of course, mysticism is always associated with a little bit of irrationalism. Now, this is also a big distinction between the Eastern Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church, because the Catholic Church, given Thomas Aquinas and his central role in scholasticism and throughout Catholic theology, uh, puts an emphasis on Aristotelian reason and logic as opposed to the as opposed to the Eastern Orthodox emphasis on mysticism and uh, kind of open endedness to certain questions. So, Ficino already being exposed to the Aristotelian ideas was a little bit uh, dissatisfied with the Aristotelian conceptions and was excited to be exposed and to learn more about Plato and and Platonic ideas. So at this Plato's Academy there in Florence, Ficino was responsible for translating much of Plato, and he is the first person to translate the entire corpus, the entire work of Plato into Latin, which again is going to have a major reverberating effect in European history. But in 1460, the Corpus Hermeticum is discovered, and in 1463, Cosmo de' Medici tells Ficino to stop translating all the Plato, even though this is essentially one of the most important works going on at the time, and to translate the Corpus Hermeticum. Why does he want him to translate the Corpus Hermeticum so bad? Because they believed Hermes Trismegistus to be one of the oldest wisdom figures of all time, older than Moses, older than Orpheus, older than... Um, Zoroaster, older than Pythagoras, and therefore Cosmo desperately wanted to read the Corpus Hermeticum in the Latin before he died, which he was able to do. And therefore, in 1463, this is the new work of Ficino to translate her, the Corpus Hermeticum into Latin. This is also where he begins to really develop these more magical understandings of the world. And he writes this book called The Book of Life. And in the Book of Life, he, he, this is 1480 to 1489, so 1463 is where he's translating the Corpus Hermeticum. In 1480, he's had you know uh, almost 20 years to digest Neoplatonism, Platonic ideas, uh, Hermetic ideas, and, um, and tried to find a synthesis for all these things. And that's a, a, an important word for Ficino's magical worldview is syncretism, because that's what he was wanting to do. And in the book of life, he goes on to describe his new magical understanding of the world as essentially evolving past the dirty magic of the medieval period. So in the medieval period, you have what was deemed dirty magic because it was literally interested in the invocation of entities, non-visible entities, angels and demons. And once the magician invoked these entities, they could get them to do their bidding in the world. This obviously relates to videos that I've made previously on God's will versus man's will and how magic is understood versus religious ritual. So this is important for Ficino to demonstrate how his uh, his sympathetic understanding of magic and the relationship of the world moved beyond that. So Ficino absolutely believed in a world soul. And this again is very important because in my very, well, one of my, not my very first, but one of my early videos on this channel, I talked about the six characteristics of esoteric spirituality. And one of them had to do with the idea of nature having a soul. This was important for Ficino. And this was also um, a little bit newer in terms of the, the ontological ideas of the world. So, in this, and I'm going to explain more about how this is so important within his framework of sympathetic relationships of nature and God. So for Ficino, you have a world soul. And therefore, when he describes in the book of life his magic as not being dirty, what he's talking about is God created the world. And therefore, herbs, plants, animals, stars, planets, these are all the works of God. And therefore, they're not they're not evil in and of themselves. You can see 
how this obviously differentiates his worldview from Gnosticism, which Gnosticism has a little bit different conception of nature and its positivity or negativity. But he does, as you will see, have a Gnostic idea of the importance of knowledge allowing one to liberate themselves. So given this world soul idea, he believed that it was essentially important for the individual to try to detach themselves from worldly things because worldly things almost entrapped man into a more monotonous and mundane world. So in his book, he talks about how scholars are prone to melancholy and melancholy. This is due to the influence of the planet Saturn and this astrology, this astrological understanding and the influence of planets onto the moods of individuals, essentially their soul, because those are souls as well. It's all one soul. It's a world soul. This is very important. And he talks about how Saturn, Mars, and the moon um, are kind of uh, have negative energy forces, whereas the sun, Venus, Jupiter and Mercury, these are, these are much more beneficent. And you can harness the energies of these planets in various ways. So for Ficino, for example, he would put on a robe in the color of the sun because the sun is arguably the most powerful of these entities, of these astrological powers, these planetary entities. And the sun, obviously the color is gold, so he'd put on a gold robe, he'd put on incense directed towards the sun, he would, um, he would light a candle of the color of the sun, he would then perform these Orphic hymns. And this is, this is a central aspect to his magical worldview, because he talks about how, what is bene- beneficent to the spirit? Well, he talks about wine being good. He talks about uh, positive odors. being uh, th- These things allow you to elevate your soul. Um, wine, odors, clean air, and then music. And for him, music was the most important aspect of his magical conception. So, as I was saying, he would play these Orphic hymns, so decked out in all these sympathetic relationships. You know, he has this robe on, he has the incense, he has candles, he has um, probably poetry, and, and then he also has these Orphic hymns that he's playing on a lyre, lyre, and he's playing these directed towards the planetary entity why he's sipping wine and he would sip wine to get a little bit intoxicated so he could open ex- himself expose himself to the noose this this more spiritual mind and he also understood even though he wasn't big on he was much more fond of plato than aristotle he still understood the aristotelian qualities of the world this had to do with hot and cold moist and dry and that again you can you take that lens and look at the world and find sympathetic relationships between various objects so again remember that he's has this conception of this world soul and therefore if you understand the cosmos correctly essentially it's a map for the soul and these planets affect your mood. And he was also had this idea that the mind affected matter, which we still see. And even in the seven principles of, or the seven hermetic principles video, where we talk about the Kabbalion, I, re- I discuss the concept of the secret and how, again, positive thinking and all this stuff. Well, well, Ficino was already there. He, he thought in very similar ways. And Ficino wanted to reconcile classical philosophy and religion, essentially the Greek tradition, with Christian theology and the Christian tradition. And for him, Jesus was um, who we ought to be, who we will be. He was the highest emanation of who uh, humanity is and could be. Again, it was God's incarnation. And so his understanding of the soul descended through these multiple hierarchies, these planetary entities, which had various qualities and virtues, which the soul takes on as it moves into the, um, the earthly realm and then eventually will become a human. So it was important then for the magician, the magus, to understand the influence of these in, these the the world soul onto your individual soul so then you can alleviate some of the influence and um 
negative energies that are being put upon you. So Ficino um, was also responsible for the revival of, of Neoplatonism and later in his life, in 1492, so again, he dies in 1499, but in 1492, he's translating Plotinus into the Latin. So, so what are the major takeaways for Ficino? Well, it has to do with a new understanding of magic, given these ideas that there's a world soul, that nature is divine. And, and remember, his father was a physician, so his father was very familiar with plants and herbs and how they can affect the body. So he had a very positive understanding of nature, um, sympathetic magic, essentially natural magic is what you call it. And he also had a very high understanding of music, music being a very magical property that can, again, affect the world and affect the human soul. He also translated Plato, the entire works of Plato into Latin, and he translated the Corpus Hermeticum into Latin. And he also translated Neoplatonic works such as Plotinus into Latin. So these are some of the major contributions of Ficino that is going to have a ripple effect um, into later European history. Now remember, he had a student named Giovanni Piccadella Marandola, and that's who I want to get to next. And arguably, Giovanni, he lived a much shorter life. He only lived 31, he, 30, for 31 years. He was 31 years old when he died. And... I'm going to get to his death. It's, it's quite interesting, some of the more recent uh, discoveries, which th shed new light on how he died and, and potentially why he, he died. But um, Giovanni Piccadella Marandola lived from 1463 to 1494. So he actually died before Marsilio Ficino. And from all accounts, Giovanni was an incredible mind. He grew up in a wealthy family. He was an immensely uh, intelligent. Apparently, he was a good-looking gentleman. And from a very young age, his mother believed that he was destined to be part of the ecclesiastical structure of the church, the Catholic church. And so by the age of 10, they already had him studying canon law, no joke. And by the time he was already a teenager, 13 to 15 years old, he's studying Greek, Hebrew, Arabic, and he is, and he's at university. So this guy, like, in, absolutely incredible. And by the time he's 23 years old, <clears throat> by the time he's 23 years old, he writes what's called the 900 Theses. And essentially, and I've mentioned this in a previous video, the 900 Theses, he, it's, it's on all topics. It's on religion, philosophy, uh, magic, um, Kabbalah, um, all these different topics. And essentially, he goes to Rome and takes all comers for a debate. And he, again, these are the 900 Theses. Later, these 900 Theses will be disavowed by Pope Innocent VIII and... There will be tension between Pico and the Vatican in regards to his theological understandings of man and, and his 900 theses, which will be renounced. Then he'll write a defense of them. Then the Vatican will renounce them again. And then he'll be forced to apologize. And then he'll, uh, the Vatican almost wants him to, to appear in, in front of them. And thanks to Lorenzo de' Medici, remember, the two students, the two famous students of Marsilio Ficino were L Lorenzo de' Medici, the son of Cosmo de' Medici, the, one of the wealthiest men in the world. Lorenzo is now running Florence, and he tells the Pope, Pope Innocent, that, um, no, I will take responsibility for Pico, and he will stay here in Florence. So, again, the Medici almost rescues uh, Pico from the powers of the Vatican. Now... Unlike Ficino, Pico was very, very interested in Jewish Kabbalah. And this is his, arguably his most influential work was that he was considered to be the, uh, the most educated person in Hebrew, in Kabbalah, that, who wasn't Jewish. And this ties to, he, and he also created what's called Christian Kabbalah, which th there's, a, there's a linguistic difference between Whenever you see Kabbalah spelled K A B B L or K A B B A L A H, 
That's Jewish Kabbalah. But if you see it spelled C-A-B-A-L-A, that's Christian Kabbalah. And this is what Pico creates because he believes that he discovers how the Tetragrammaton, as you, you guys are probably familiar with, is the uh, is a uh, magical Jewish conception of God, Yahweh, that if you place a sheen inside the middle of Yahweh, you get Yeshua. Now, of course, this is debated, and most Jews don't believe this at all, but you get Yeshua, which is the pentagrammaton, and this is the new deity. This is the, uh, this is the revelation of Christianity and how it supersedes Judaism. Now, the historical growth out of how he gets exposed to Judy or to uh, Jewish Kabbalah comes from first the book of creation, the Sefer Yetzirah. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but it is a magical book in um, the third century, which, which first tried to express these Kabbalistic ideas in the tree of life and how they related to the Hebrew, Hebrew language and the world of angels and God and all that stuff. This leads into the 12th century text called the Book of Illumination or the Sefer Bahir. This is where the tree of life begins to be referred to as the tree of emanation. And this is um, a very magical understanding. And, and remember that the Iberian Peninsula, we're talking about Spain and Portugal here, is occupied and ruled by the Muslims at the time. And this was an immense period of learning. So much syncretism is going on between the Arabs uh, Arab Muslims, the Jews, and the Christians. And this kind of conglomerate, this amalgamation of different thought, allowed for Pico to be exposed to Jewish Kabbalah and to try to interpret it in new ways, given that that's kind of the milieu in which they were working in. So, given his emphasis on Hebrew, I mean, Pico, to the point, believed that Hebrew was essential for the highest forms of magic, and that if you really wanted to call on the angels, and this is common within Kabbalic thought, that if you really wanted to call on the angels and get and get in touch with uh, various entities and work your way up the spiritual hierarchy, the tree of life, that you had to know Hebrew, because the tree of life had to do with the 12 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, right? So he was interested in Hebraic ideas of like gematria, which is the how words have numeric values and you can add those up and create new patterns. This is also true in Greek. However, it's much more explicit within Jewish Kabbalah. So as as, so, as well as the notericon, no, ter, and that is the making of acronyms from sentences. So this was another way for to embed more esoteric messages within Hebraic texts is that they would use notericon techniques where you would take essentially the first letter of each sentence and you could create acronyms that would then form words that would have embedded messages that inside uh, more explicit text. And then you also, also have the tamura or the thumura, which is the rearranging of words and letters to discover new layers of meaning. So these are a couple of the three different techniques that Pico was just fascinated by. And he thought this is what contributed to his idea of Hebrew being such a spectacular language. So within Kabbalah, there's this idea that there's 72 angels and that again, through the the Hebraic letters and the Hebrew language, you can get in touch with these and call out their esoteric names, which by knowing the name, you have dominion over them. This is a very important magical idea, and this is also why Jews don't want to pronounce the name of God, but also why God doesn't have a name. When he appears to Moses as the burning bush, he says, I am. His name is I am because he's not, uh, God isn't giving him a name which would allow him to conceptually take hold of that would encapsulate God into a specific name. He is I am, he is being which then this concept of God being being is going to, it relates to uh, Ficino's emphasis on Plato and his relationship on being and unity, as opposed to the rationalism of Aristotle. So Pico believed there to be a symmetry between Jewish Kabbalah and the Corpus Hermeticum. Again, at this time, Hermes is believed to be this very ancient figure. So 
when they're talking about Hermeticism, they believe this wisdom to be going back to the oldest days of Egypt. And of course, we already have ta- you know modern understandings of like the Emerald Tablets and how Hermetic thought is um, a evolution from Thoth and from Egyptian understandings of Thoth, the wisdom deity there. But uh, this ancient idea of Hermes Trismegistus also colored Pico's understanding of Hermeticism. And he also believed, like Ficino, that medieval magic was demonic because, again, you're, you're calling on angels and demons to do your work. And Pico always cautioned all his, well, I guess his readers, his readers about um, working in a faith or in, an, or in, a, uh, in a very pietistic manner. So because he believed when you start working in the Sephiroths and invoking these angelic entities, there's also demonic entities. And so to avoid the demonic entities, you had to have yourself in a more purified and pietistic state. So for Ficino and Pico, despite what any modern day um, Catholic uh, theologian or evangelical Christian might consider their these magical understandings to be heretical, for both Vicino and Pico, they very much were in line with Christian understandings and viewed themselves as Christians. I mean, the whole work of Pico's Kabbalistic um, undertakings had to do with the uh, with proving cr- Christianity as superseding Judaism and using Hebrew and using the the Jewish tradition of Kabbalah to essentially validate that claim. So, um, we have a so. Pico, I told you that he wrote the 900 Theses, but he also wrote, he later wrote a book called The Oration on the Dignity of Man. And this is considered to be a rhetorical masterpiece uh, and a very, very important book in the Renaissance. In fact, um, arguably one of the more important works. And in it, he talks a lot about his a lot of these theses within the 900 theses, he kind of embeds within the oration on the dignity of man. And um, he talks about sympathetic magic in it. He talks about how, uh, well, actually, I think he is also writing what was called the uh, magical conclusion, the 26 magical conclusions. He also has a work on that. And that's also hinted in the oration on the dignity of man. But in the oration on the dignity of man, one of the central aspects was him trying to divinize humanity, which again, he's challenging the human ontology of the Catholic Church who understood humanity as being the, I don't want to say evolved because evolution wasn't necessarily um, one of their frameworks for looking at nature, but Humanity was the most important of the animal species. They occupied a unique aspect, given the Aristotelian ideas of the soul and reason and all this stuff, logic. And uh, in that theosis was an eschatological um, occurrence, that, that humanity was eventually going to merge with God. Essentially, that's what Jesus Christ was. He was the... He was, uh, you know, essentially 2,000 years ago, he was who man will eventually become. This was a very consistent idea within Pico's, or not not Pico's because he's challenging it, but Ficino and, and the Catholic Church and in general. This is very important in their worldview. So he believed, Pico, that man was an object of divination and that Unlike the angels, unlike demons, and unlike animals, man can make himself into whatever he wants to mold himself into. And that, that's just, this is a central thesis within the Oration on the Dignity of Man, is that man's freedom and man's ability to mold himself into higher and higher forms. So, in, in his magical conclusions writing, though, Pico actually takes shots at... Ficino's conceptions of magic. So, as I've mentioned, Ficino was much more emphasis, uh, much more focused on Orphic hymns, music, sympathetic magics of sympathetic magic related to the planetary bodies, 
where Fichi, or for Pico, he's much more interested in Kabbalah. And so Pico actually challenges Ficino's idea of magic. He says that, yes, nat- natural magic is good and positive and that that's something that should be celebrated. However, it is a very weak form without Jewish Kabbalah. And because, uh, in his perception, Pico, that natural magic had to do with second causes because it had to do with finding sympathetic relationships to the created world, the planetary bodies, plants, herbs, animals, all this stuff. Whereas for him, Kabbalah had to do with the first cause. It had to do with the invisible world. So it had to do with angels and demons and and essentially working your way up to the Godhead for a full um, interaction, a fuller understanding of what God is. And that he talked about how Natural magic dealt with characters, essentially the the language being used and expressed. He understood it as characters, whereas he understood Hebrew as numbers, and that numbers were entering at a more important and more primary reality than traditional letters and words. So that's a really interesting concept. So. That's basically all that I had to say about Pico. Again, he ends up dying in uh, 1494, and he was traditionally believed to have died from a fever. However, I've recently learned that his bones were excavated, and when his bones were discovered and they did analysis on them, they found mercury um, and arsenic in his bones, as well as a vertebrae that was dramatically damaged in some way, and they believed that he was could have been stabbed or, or something like that or hit with a sword. But now it's believed not that he died from a fever, but that actually he was having a homosexual relationship with another man. He, he was performing sodomy, and he was caught by that because, remember, he was under the aegis of Lorenzo de' Medici, so he had full protection by essentially the wealthiest family in the world, and yet somehow he was killed, and that, that murder was covered up as a fever. But now it's most likely that he was killed because he was gay. So that's a little interesting tidbit right there. So some of the takeaways, uh, Ficino, natural magic, sympathetic relationships, um, performing rituals with like the robe of the sun, incense, candles of the sun, um, talismans of the sun, uh, amulets of the sun, performing Orphic hymns to the sun, and then you can use these planetary entities to affect your own soul and elevate your soul and try to move away from the monotonous and mundane world of everyday life. Very focused on sympathetic magic. Again, he translated all the works of Plato into Latin as well as the Corpus Hermeticum. For Pico, he was the first Christian to really dive into the Hebrew. He understood Kabbalah. He he even used Kabbalah to prove that Christianity superseded Judaism. And he believed that Hebrew was a very divine and magical language and, and was essential for magical operations. So... That is kind of the overview of who Pico and Ficino was. I'm sure there's things that I missed. I just kind of write down some bullet points and I try to just flow and stay on topic. I appreciate your guys' criticism of, of how I ramble and go on to various different topics. I'm trying to not do that and stay focused and stay on point. So anyways, please let me know what you guys think. That's pretty much all that I had for today. I wanted to speak on these two gentlemen and their important role, which I can reference back to when I discuss later uh, Christian magical figures. But uh, thanks again for everything. Uh, Please like, share, and subscribe. Let me know what you think. Um, What are your conceptions of the Ficino and Pico's understanding of magic? Do you agree? Do you disagree? Do you find it to be heretical? Do you think that there's a place within these uh, theoretical frameworks within Christian theology? Um, My personal belief is that religious ritual is already built on these understandings of sympathies. So... I think it all goes back to one's will. That's why that God's will, man's will video, I, I think is the important distinguishing factor between if what we would what people deem as magic is heretical or not. But anyways, that's for you guys to figure out on your own. So 
Let me know what you think. Again, please like, share, and subscribe. And uh, I love you guys. And thank you for the support. And thank you for the criticism. It's all, it's all helpful. So thank you and God bless.